Um, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm MC Owens, and as usual, this is our last Friday of the month, Something Visual Buddhism with MC Owens. And this time, it's a it's an old presentation I haven't done for a while uh, called Magic Circle, the Art and Architecture of Mandalas, Buddhist Mandalas. Um, and yeah, like I said, uh, this is a talk I've been giving for a long time. I kind of actually developed this talk during my graduate school days. It's changed a lot since then. Um, but this was sort of a side interest of mine. Uh, it's a side interest in Buddhist art, but in particular, this unique form of art uh, called the mandala or the circle. Um, and that's why I've called this talk the magic circle. And so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to lead you on a visual journey uh, through the world of Buddhist mandalas. We're going to start with a quick introduction just to the idea of what a mandala is, because of course the, the Buddhists don't have the sole uh, rights and use of the mandala. They're used by many traditions, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but the you know the general idea here is that we're going to explore about four or five buddhist mandalas in in detail but like i said before we do that we kind of just need to get a little crash course in some basic ideas of this type of uh, uh sacred art if you will uh and so from the top everybody knows i like to start etymologically i'm a big believer in words and so this word mandala or mandala, I, um, the pronunciation, getting different reports on which the emphasis should be on. But the manda is definitely our circle with the end, the la being the essence, the mandala, the essence of a circle. And so, so from right away, I just want you to know that tonight is about circles. It's about some mysteries of circles. Um, and so that's just going to be in the background all night tonight is this, the theme of the circle. And of course, I have here on the screen, sort of a, um, well, maybe the simplest mandala ever, the Buddhist, which is the, the Buddhist, the Zen circle. It's like a, a calligraphy circle here. Um, and even though you might not think of that as a mandala, as we go through this, you might um, change your mind on that. Um, so really quickly, I just want to show you a few things. This term mandala, it originally referred to the circle, the manda, the circle that would be drawn on the ground before you made a sacred fire, like a, a performing a puja or some sort of fire ceremony. This is, of course, in India, time immemorable, thousands and thousands of years ago, this practice goes back to of making a circle in the ground and then creating a sacred fire within it. That was sort of the original mandala, the sacred circle, the sacred fire circle. Okay. And so that's what this kind of image is just kind of to represent is that original, or at least how, what it seems historically is the origin of this practice is the making of a fire pit. Usually don't make fire pits square. <laughs> Sometimes you usually make them round, so or circular in that sense. Now, where we're going from here, though, is is a, is a visual world, not a world necessarily a practice. Although we will get into mandala practice later on, but we're going to be talking about these images. And so, what I want to show you right now is a very simple image. It's an upward pointed triangle inside of a circle. <laughs> And while this is a mandala, there's also a word for in Sanskrit for this very simple type of uh, sacred geometry, if you want to call it that, or just geometry. And this would be called a yantra. And the word yantra interestingly translates to a machine. But of course, you know, the word yantra, the Sanskrit word yantra is very, very old word. And so we're very curious about what they might have meant by a machine, right? But what I want to kind of share with you, and this is just our first step in looking at the meaning of these mandalas, is that this upward pointing triangle is sort of capturing uh, this idea. 
because an upward pointing triangle traditionally is representative of the element of fire. It is pointed up, has stability. Um, there's a lot of things I could actually say about just this symbol of the upwards pointing triangle traditionally symbolic of the, the, the male female or the male reproductive organ. Uh, again, fire, the upward movement, all of these things. And so that's a yantra, just this simple kind of geometry within the circle. And that's what I want you to notice right away is that we're dealing with a triangle in a circle, right? And so I just, uh, sorry, I just mentioned that this word, uh, that this upwards pointing triangle might be the fire and the male reproductive organ. Well, a downwards pointing triangle is traditionally female reproductive organ, the element of water, of course, the direction of down. But even looking at this though, just the meaning and significance has become different. Now we're on our a point, we're kind of potentially teetering on the edge here, whereas our other triangle is very stable, is the idea. And so these two are kind of interesting, just to notice the slight difference between putting the triangle one way, putting the triangle other way, and then some traditional significance cultures have given to that in terms of male-female, elemental significance and otherwise. Now, they say, of course, that the, the natural order of things is for the fire to go up and the water to go down to seek its natural resting place. And so to have the water on the bottom and the fire on the top makes sense. But there's an old uh, piece of alchemical magic I wanna tell you about. And it's the magic, the alchemy, this almost the original form of alchemy, which is what happens when you put fire below water, when you actually flip their natural order. Well, what happens when you put the water above the fire, the fire wanting to go up and the water wanting to go down, you get boiled water and it cooks your food. <laughs> One of the oldest forms of alchemy is putting the water on top of the fire. And so that just right there, that simple polarity between the upwards pointing triangle, downwards pointing triangle, fire, water, what have you, that dynamic interplay between upwards pointing triangle and downwards pointing triangle is probably most best captured in this. Now we're not at a Buddhist level yet. This is all introductory. These are all very ancient symbols coming out of India. But you might, you'll see here a series of upwards pointing triangles, a series of downwards pointing triangles. This is an ancient image called the Sri Yantra. And so if we're going with machine as a translation of Yantra, uh, Sri means a uh, beautiful, fortunate, something to that effect. And so this beautiful, fortunate machine now, one of the things right away that it, I would not encourage you to necessarily do right now, because we're gonna be moving on soon, but even just trying to count the number of triangles here in itself gives you a sense of what these yantras or mandalas are all about, which is sort of drawing your attention to that sort of center of the mandala. And then this idea of then spending some mental time there to say, try to count the number of triangles, anchoring the focus, anchoring the awareness. But you might also be interested to know that this symbol, the Sri Yantra has a sound. And that sound is traditionally Om, which is the symbol here, the Sanskrit symbol I have up on the screen here. And so indeed, in addition to the visual quality of these things, and then in addition to the symbolic meaning here, again, of having this kind of alchemical collision of triangles, collision of upward and downward energy, that all of that is sort of built into this idea of the, the, the yantra or the mandala, as well as a potential auditory level this idea that these things might actually have an acoustic 
or again, kind of an auditory quality to them. This one usually giving the auditory quality of the sacred sound of Om. Now, what you can do with these mandalas, of course, and a Sri Yantra, this beautiful machine, which even looking at this can get a little intense. And so you might want to put a little in encasement around that to sort of hold that energy in a little bit. So the reason why I sort of start to walk you through this is I don't want you to get too distracted by the, uh, you know, the, the, the things on the side and sort of the, the aesthetics of these things. Although all of the aesthetics are interesting and, and significant in that way, I want you to sort of start to see the sort of packaging, if you will, of, the, of what's going on in the middle. You could even go so far as to color it. But what I want you to see now is that when we've added the border, when we've added the lotus flower circle, so not just a regular old circle, but now a kind of floral circle. And again, we've added the color and a certain uh, box. I want you to notice how the triangle and that kind of intensity of those triangles has sort of subsided a little bit. And you can kind of start to see, especially because of the way this one is colored, you can kind of start to see that the very center of this mandala is a downward pointing triangle. And the only reason I point that out is because I want you to sort of know or consider that the heart or the essence of a, any particular mandala can indeed be found at its center. Like whatever the meaning or significance of it is, it's right in the heart of it. It's part of how these things work. And that is our first mandala, which by the way, was a triangle inside of a circle. <laughs> now, granted, we made it a few triangles, but it was this, this simple idea of a three-sided object inside of a circle. So now let's check out a four-sided object inside of a circle. This is our first Buddhist proper mandala. So what I showed you before is sort of traditional yantras, mandalas of India, the Kala Chakra, and Chakra means a wheel, Kala is time, and so the Wheel of Time mandala. This is arguably the most famous or most well-known Buddhist mandala. mandala. Um, it's uh, very particularly popular in the Tibetan tradition, as are most mandalas. Um, I won't have too much time tonight to talk about the larger Buddhist traditions that use mandalas, but I want you to know that the uh, Tibetan tradition is really um, founded on a lot of mandala use, and this is one of them. And you might be familiar with this mandala from the Tibetan tradition of having the Tibetan monks kind of painstakingly tap out the entire mandala in sand, right? Um, so this is sort of a well-known practice of the Tibetan tradition, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, which is to create these beautiful mandalas that take days and days to construct, to create them gr one grain of, literally one grain of sand at a time, which in itself is an amazing meditation exercise. And I know that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of lore about the, the fact that when the monks are done with these mandalas and after they have been observed, part of the idea of doing them in sand is that they blow the mandala away or they dump it into the sea is usually a, the practice. And so there's the usual meaning or significance of that is this sort of Buddhist impermanence, non-attachment, We've made this you know, beautiful work of art, but we are so unattached to it that we just you know, blow it away. And I'm not gonna say that's not going on. That's, that's definitely a part of the, the, uh, the modern performance of the making of these mandalas is very much a modern performance of the Buddhist act of non-attachment and all of that. But I want you to know, you know that this, practice of using these sacred uh, geometric patterns, the practice of using mand mandalas is right up there with this, this kind of art of secret mantras, secret chants, and also right up there with the secret hand gestures, the, the, the mudras. 
And so my point is, is that from my historical research, the real reason why these were done originally in sand was because the exact design of these mandalas in a Buddhist tradition or a tantric, I should say a tantric tradition, the exact design was a secret. And so you would do the design to instruct the student, show them how to make it, but then you would quickly get rid of it so that nobody else could see it, so that it could stay a secret. <laughs> so that seems to be one original reason why these were done in uh, ephemeral mediums uh, like sand. But also, just one last thing, the use of sand on the ground might also be an original nod to the practice of making a, a sacred fire pit, which would also go along with the impermanence of blowing it away. So, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the actual symbolism of this uh, mandala, this uh, square inside of a circle here. Now, you might notice right away that this square inside the circle is actually four triangles. So I just want you to know that we haven't strayed too far from our original Sri Yantra, that original beautiful mantra of the triangle. We haven't strayed too far, but we are now definitely looking at a square inside of a circle. And that of course is going to have a very different feeling, a different vibe, a different sense to it than our upwards pointing triangle or our downwards pointing triangle. We now have a very uniform, um, you know, equal on all sides, very stable object inside of our circle, right? And so, again, like our other Sri Yantra that I showed you, there's a lot of beautiful decorative things going on on the sides, all of which has significance and meaning, Dharma wheels, the Tibetan script on the side. But I want to bring your attention to the actual square. The orientation of this thing is very important in terms of looking at it, that the dark, black, dark, 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 dark blue or black uh, triangle of the bottom is representative of the element of water. And so these four parts of the triangle are representative of the four great elements, including fire, including earth, and including air or wind, depending on the tradition. And usually if it's wind, it's usually green instead of white, but we don't need to get too into that because I don't want you to get too hung up on these things having one particular meaning. In fact, in addition to being the four great elements here, there is also a directional component to this mandala, which is that the bottom is always understood to be the east, this the south to the left, west on top, and north to the right. And the reason why that is, is that if you start to look at this mandala, if you look at this square, in, in, there's an interesting way to look at Buddhist mandalas. And it's to look at them as an aerial view. So if you start to think that you're actually flying over an object, it might be a pyramid. <laughs> it might be a four-sided pyramid that you're flying over. If I were just to try to lead you into the third dimension, and indeed, in addition to having the geometric significance, in addition to having the juxtaposition significance, like positing triangles of different directions, like the juxtaposition, and then in addition to having a potential acoustic sound quality, these mandalas also have a, a three-dimensional quality. They are not to be viewed as flat, 2D on the wall. They are to be viewed, again, you, if you would like to do it, you could view it as an aerial view. And the aerial view that you are now flying over is of, sorry, is of this. It's the entire cosmos. It is the, well, the solar system at least, and potentially the entire universe. But what you are flying over is actually an aerial view of Mount Meru and the, the traditional four continents of Buddhism or of Buddhist cosmology or even Indian cosmology for that matter. 
there are these four great continents around this giant mountain. And so now if I may flip this kind of to its, uh, this view. So now our mandala is lying flat with the center of the mandala coming out and that's Mount Maru, the sacred axis mundi of our world or our universe with the heavenly realms up above all the way down to the continents with the hell realms down below. So I just want you to know that when, when you were looking at the mandala a second ago, or let me get us back there, you're up in the heavenly realms. You're above Mount Maru gazing down at the whole universe. How beautiful is that? <laughs> so there's so much more I could say about any one of these mandalas. And indeed I do give talks just on each of these that are much longer and in, in greater detail. But I just wanted to share this one with you to give you that sense of what, I don't know, what a four-sided object inside of a circle could might conjure up. So I'm going to skip the pentagram. I know it's Halloween or it's almost Halloween. I'm going to skip the five-sided object inside of the circle. Um, there are uh, many mandalas, Buddhist mandalas and otherwise that incorporate the five-sided uh, star inside of a circle. I'm going to skip that one and I'm going to move us right along. Oh, and I wanted to mention too, Buddhists, of course, are not the only ones that use mandalas. This is a Christian uh, kind of stained glass, also in a mandala circular with the most important uh, thing being in the middle, Jesus in the middle and in the middle of the middle, as it were. Um, there's also, of course, something interesting going on in Christianity in terms of like what they call astro theology. It's like he's called the son of God, but it's is it S-U-N or S-O-N? Because a lot of the Christian kind of uh, mandalas come from this kind of interesting tradition. Now, this is our Copernican model, which, oh my gosh, you know, this, this mandala was illegal in Europe for a while to show the sun being in the center with the planets going around it. And then interestingly, this 12 block circle around the edges, of course, representing the 12 months. But I just want you to start to think, you know, like I just mentioned with our wheel of time, that that is the, the universe, the, the, the stars and the sky and all of it. And so the mandala here, a European example, a mandala as a, uh, what's that called? Like an astrolab or like a sky, a version of the sky. We see this in Egyptian uh, culture as well. This is would be essentially an Egyptian mandala, which is also astro theological in terms of constellations and the, the, again, the sky. And an Aztec uh, sundial is also a mandala, very similar to our Copernican model in terms of the sun in the middle and everything around it. So I just want you to, to again, kind of, uh, I don't want you to think, I think Buddhists are the only ones that use mandalas. These are everywhere. These are just, have been a few examples, but I wanted to kind of mention that so that when we come back to the Buddhist mandalas, we're thinking about them a little differently. And so again, I'm skipping over the, the, the five, but now we will have a beautiful mandala with a, a hexagram, a six pointed star inside of a circle. Um, now, yes, the six pointed star has other religious significance, but I wanna talk to you about that. This is our upwards pointing triangle in a circle. We've already seen an upwards pointing triangle in a circle. And there's a downwards pointing triangle in a circle. We've seen a downwards pointing triangle in a circle. When you put the two together, not uh, like I mentioned alchemically by putting one below the other, flipping them, but when you actually put them together, the male and the female in harmony, the elements in harmony, indeed this symbol, the, the six pointed star is traditionally a symbol of unity, peace, harmony, things in balance. And that is the idea of it, again, with having the one triangle upwards, one triangle pointing downwards. But the reason why I 
chose this mandala to sort of focus on right now is because of that. So this is where, if you followed me <clears throat> at the beginning, and I mentioned that in many cultures, not just India, not just Buddhism, not just Buddhist cultures, the downwards pointing triangle is traditionally a uh, symbolic representation of the feminine <clears throat> or the female, whereas the upwards pointing triangle is the, the masculine or the male in that sense. And so if you were just to see this, and, and particularly if you were to see this mandala the way I've kind of highlighted it here, there's a way in which even without having a clear, uh, um, uh, uh, a clear sense or a clear image of what's in the middle of this mandala, you might be able to already feel or guess what's going to be at the middle of this. Because I've already mentioned that whatever is at the very heart of the mandala is the essence or meaning of it. And although it's a very blurry here, what's in the middle of this mandala is the Vajra Yogini, right? This very interesting female character within Buddhism. The a Yogini is a female practitioner of yoga, and this is the Vajra Yogini. Um, this is an illustration of the Vajra Yogini that's very similar to what's at the center of the mandala I was just showing you. But I also wanted to just show you this. This is a beautiful statue of the Vajra Yogini. You might have noticed in the previous one that she actually has a skull that she drinks, um, um, I think it's menstrual blood to make, to make this even more feminine. It might just be like blood, but there's that. And then she also has a, um, a uh, kind of a, a shell or something in her right hand. I wanted you to notice in this statue, she's making the gesture, but she hasn't, she doesn't have the skull cup and she doesn't have the little shell, but I bet you this beautiful little statue, once upon a time, I bet you it had a beautiful little uh, skull uh, shell in one hand. Um, but the reason why I point this out is that a statue like this of Vajra Yogini would very much be used in the practice of the actual mandala, which is what I mean is, is that these mandalas, particularly in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, are used kind of devotionally, or they are used to establish a kind of a relationship with a particular bodhisattva, particular Buddha, particular um, uh, being like this Vajra Yogini. Um, and so again, by staring at the mandala, gazing at the mandala is probably a better word. One can kind of... Um, well, develop a relationship with certain deities, if I can use that term. Okay, and, and I had, didn't mention this at the top, but this is only gonna be probably um, about an hour, about another half hour pre, uh, presentation, and then I'll uh, wind down for questions if you have any. So please hold them off until then. Um, all right, and here it is. Again, our hexagram, our six pointed star inside of a circle. Let's move on. So this is, a, this is a particular mandala that I do a whole other talk on, break it down piece by piece, um, probably second to the Kala Chakra, the Wheel of Time. This is the Bhava Chakra, the Wheel of Life. So whereas the Kala Chakra is a cosmological map of time, that's why it's called the Wheel of Time, and a cosmological map of the world and the universe. This is the Buddhist um, wheel of life. This is the Buddhist representation of samsara, of birth, death, and rebirth, and the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, and birth, death, and rebirth. And this is a pretty complicated mandala. Uh, that's why I do a whole separate talk on it. And so I'm not going to walk you through every single part of it, but I do want to walk you quickly through the basics. The basics of this mandala are a circle. This is indeed a mandala. It is a circle, but this circle is in the grip of this being. This being is Mara, 
the evil one whose name means death. <laughs> so this is the Buddhist kind of equivalent to the devil. But this is, of course, as, as I often say, Mara is just the personification of our collective greed, anger, and delusion. So the Buddhists are very clear that this is not a being per se, but it is a being because it is you and I on our worst day at our most angry, most deluded, and most desirous. So that's sort of just uh, the idea here of Mara has the wheel of life in his grips, okay? And so I wanna walk you quickly through the wheel of life. It begins at the very center. And if you, if I didn't, I said it already a few times, but the essence of every mandala is right at the heart of it. And so the very heart of this mandala is a representation of a pig, a snake, and a bird of some sort. These three animals represent the three poisons or the three kleshas that I just mentioned. Greed, anger, and delusion. Uh, the, the bird, the kind of chicken or, or fowl that once it gets a hold of something won't let go, that's the greed, they say the anger of a snake that's quick to bite, quick to anger, and the delusion of the pig that, you know, traditionally wallows in its own filth, right? Those are the ideas here. Um, there's a lot of other cultural things about these three animals, but the idea is, is that they represent these three defilements, as they, it is sometimes translated, these three kleshas, Greed, anger, and delusion. Those are the problems. And that's what is, at, again, at the very heart of samsara. And depending on how you deal with your greed, your anger, and your delusion, determines this next rung. And this next rung, all of this, by the way, should be seen as moving clockwise. It should all have a very clockwise motion. And in particular, this part of it, which is on the right-hand side, the dark side, these beings are being drugged down into hell. <laughs> and the beings on the left side are, are on the stairway up to heaven. <laughs> and basically, depending on how you deal with your greed, anger, and delusion, which are at the middle, you go up or you go down. That's what's turning the wheel of samsara, greed, anger, and delusion. And depending on if you're greedy, angry, or deluded, you're headed down. And if you're generous instead of greedy, if you're kind and compassionate instead of angry, and if you are knowledgeable and enlightened rather than deluded, you're headed up. So that's the lesson of the second rung of this uh, mandala. And then we get to the sort of heart of it, if you will. These are the six paths of rebirth. And so to further illustrate the going up or the going down based on your dealing with your greed, anger, and delusion, this mandala depicts the traditional six paths of rebirth. The first path of rebirth here is, let me blow this up. This is the, the human realm. This is the realm of your farm and your city life and just you and I in the world. And yes, that is within Mara's grasp. And it's a potential place for you to be reborn. In fact, you've been reborn there right now. <laughs> now, if you don't play your cards right, you don't play your greed, anger, and delusion cards right, you're gonna find yourself potentially falling into the realm of the hungry ghosts with their distended stomachs and their tiny little necks and their insatiable hunger. <laughs> now, if you're really bad with your greed, anger, and delusion, then you're going all the way down before Yama, the kind of king of hell, who will dole out the proper punishment for your evil deeds. And so you might be boiled alive, you might be uh, drawn and quartered, all kinds of tortures await you in the lower realms of hell. You may also find yourself being born in the animal realm among the elephants and camels in the world. But still, 
in Mara's grasp. You might even find yourself in the exalted, uh, you, you might take Elon Musk's hyper, hyper loop right over to the, the wherever and become reborn as an Asura, a demigod on earth, right? So that's one possible uh, rebirth for you, depending on your greed, anger, and delusion. And you could even go so far as to be reborn in a heavenly realm as a deva or a devi, as a god or a goddess. Now, you'd have the problem, of course, of the asuras constantly trying to war with you, and you would still be in Mara's grasp. <laughs> So those are the six paths of rebirth represented in this beautiful mandala. But the real wisdom of this, and I'm not going to say actually that there's not a lot of wisdom in everything I just said, but the real wisdom of this mandala is this outermost ring. Interestingly, 12 blocks going around the edge, but these don't represent the months, or do they in some level? but they do traditionally represent the 12 links in the chain of causation or the 12 links of pratitya samutpatta, dependent origination. This is ultimately the wisdom, the knowledge of what is um, not creating the cycle of samsara, right? That's at the middle. That's the greed, anger, and delusion. But what is sort of binding it in or holding that energy of greed, anger, and delusion, holding it in are these 12 links, beginning with ignorance, leading to uh, mental conditioning, consciousness. And you could, you could watch my whole class on this to go all the way around, but these are the 12 links of causation that cause the greed, anger, and delusion that cause the six paths of rebirth, that cause the movement up and down, that cause the greed, anger, and delusion. That is the meaning of this outermost ring. And again, that is like the wisdom or the knowledge that the Dharma offers is the knowledge of causation. And if you were to do that, and if you were to study this mandala and all of the meanings in it, you would escape this evil being, Mara, and his grasp, and you would find yourself here, outside the mandala, outside of samsara. And there on the right is our monk pointing to the left, which is the, the pure land of the Buddha, that symbolically is outside of Mara, outside of dependent origination, and even outside of all the suffering. That's just a lightning fast, quick run through the wheel of, of life. I want you to kind of start to see how these mandalas in the Buddhist tradition are working on many, many levels. And in particular with the wheel of life here, I'd like you to see how they're starting to pack a lot of information into this circle, <laughs> right? It used to just be a good old triangle in a circle. But now we're packing a lot more information into this mandala, right? So before we move on, another a review of these, the natural world of mandalas, right? I used to have a lot more slides of naturally occurring mandalas, like this beautiful eclipse, the eyeball, right? This is a good one. This is a classic Chinese mandala, the yin and yang symbol, right? This is a great one too because of the, the, um, <clears throat> the simplicity of it, but there's a lot of meaning to this, of course. Uh, this is also an upwards pointing triangle, downwards pointing triangle kind of a thing in terms of that it is the male and female, the light and the dark, the sun and the moon. It's basically all possible oppositions that you could imagine in one, of course, there's that beautiful significance of the smaller dot inside the larger swirl, representing this sort of that at the very heart of the light is the dark, and at the very heart of the dark is the light. There's that beautiful thing. And 
like I was saying before, there's a lot of layers to these mandalas. They could be uh, cosmological maps of the sky. They have the juxtaposition of meanings. They might have an auditory quality. They're three-dimensional. Well, there's one more level to these that you gotta be aware of. And there's no better one to start with than the yin and yang symbol here. You know, the, the white part is the, the yang, the, the fire, the light that just wants to, you know, climb to the sky full of energy. And what they say is, is that if you look at this mandala, the yin and yang symbol, the white yang part, it actually begins as a tiny, the tiniest little ember at the bottom, and then actually grows like a fire as it get, goes up. And the idea is, is that while Yang is doing that, Yin, which has the energetic quality of water, just seeks the lowest place and sort of falls down right where Yang kind of rises up from. And so this mandala is a great example of how one should see mandalas as actually having motion as well. And I tried to do that a little bit with the wheel of time, or sorry, the wheel of life just a moment ago, that clockwise motion. But again, I want you to, to know that. Another naturally occurring mandala is the beautiful flower. I already mentioned the lotus flower border that a lot of these mandalas have. And that, of course, you know, it leads to another level or layer to these mandalas, which is sort of the, I mean, there's no better way to put it than just that the target like quality, that there's something about a mandala that draws your attention towards the center of it. But that's, that's exactly like a flower does to a bee or any other pollinator. Right, the way that the 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 design or the aesthetics of flowers seemingly work. I'm not I'm not a bee or a pollinator, but our our imagination as humans is that they too are sort of drawn to this that whoa, what's going on in there? Right, there's a certain curiosity to what's going on in the middle of a flower, and of course, even in the image here you can start to see the fractal geometry involved here that it is indeed a naturally occurring mandala. And that of course is a level or a layer to all mandalas is this sort of, you know, they're kind of like weird human flower things <laughs> or something, right? You know, I don't, I don't want to get too into that, but I just want you to know that as we move into um, basically our last uh, uh, deep dive into a mandala for the night. Um, and it's going to start with this very simple red lotus flower. So this is a mandala all by itself, a Buddhist mandala all by itself, the eight petaled lotus flower. Just that is sort of an interesting idea. You know, it's like, it kind of even does something weird to our circle where it makes the circle have eight parts in a way because there's nothing in the circle. It's like the circle is already this sort of floral design. But where this eight petaled lotus flower goes, I shouldn't, yeah, I don't want to say where it comes from, but where it uh, flowers into is this Garba Datu Mandala, the, the, the womb realm or the matrix realm. The, the word Datu means a dimension or a realm. Uh, if you're familiar with Buddhism, you know about the Rupa Datu, A Rupa Datu, Karma Datu. Well, this is the Garba Datu. And Garba, again, is this word that it, it means womb, like a woman's womb in that way. But it also means a matrix of a certain sense, a kind of, um, well, it's actually this word matrika, the Sanskrit word matrika is where we get the English word matrix from. 
And this matrix is, you know, kind of a lot of smaller pieces of information in one big piece of information. And indeed, that's a good way of talking about a mandala is as a matrix. And so this is called the matrix world, um, or it's sometimes called the matrix world or the, the again, the matrix realm. And so in, to walk us through this, and this is sort of one of my favorite uh, mandalas um, in terms of packing in information, this is probably one of the most heavily dense, densely packed of Buddhist mandalas. Um, as we walk through this, because there's a lot going on here, we're gonna start with a simple uh, colorless version so we can really see what's going on here. I already mentioned this is where the uh, eight petaled lotus flower um, develops. And the reason why I kind of say that about this is where the eight petaled lotus flower develops, the eight petaled lotus flower is a very, 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 very old Buddhist symbol. It might be one of the oldest up there with the Dharma wheel. And this mandala that I'm about to walk you through seems to be the, you know, that basically that simple eight petaled lotus is going to get added onto and then added onto and then added onto and added onto and added onto and added onto until it's this complex. So the first thing that we need to clear up is what's at the middle of this Garba Datu mandala. And what's in the middle of this, and you can't see too well, because uh, uh, this is from a very old mandala, these images, but at the middle of it is this Buddha. This is a very special Buddha. Um, I'm, the, tonight's talk is not about the deeper iconography and all of that, so I'm not going to get too into this. But this is a Buddha called Vairochana, the Great Sun Buddha, S-U-N. And so right away, if I tell you that, oh, this is a Buddha that is the cosmic Buddha, that is, is the Dharma body, is enlightenment itself, and they call it the great sun Buddha. And guess what? It's right at the middle of this mandala. You might notice though that this uh, interesting Buddha has a crown with five Buddha's in this crown. And what's interesting is, is that th that symbol of the Buddha in the middle with the four comes across in this mandala itself. So this is already going to start to get a little, um, what would I call it, holographic, right? Where the, the mandala already has the mandala inside of itself. <laughs> so what I mean by that is, is that on these petals of this eight petal lotus flower in the top bottom and on the sides are the four kind of primary buddhas uh akshobhya in the east oh and by the way the orientation of this mandala is east on top this time and with mandalas you always want to know the proper orientation so you can kind of get yourself oriented i um the Ratna Sambhava, the jeweled bodied Buddha in the southern direction, which would be to the, our right. Amitabha in the west, Amida Buddha, the Buddha of infinite life. And then the Amoga Siddhi, this uh, Buddha of fearlessness. So those four Buddhas with Vairochana in the middle is what Vairochana has on his crown sitting in the middle of this mandala. And then what you have are these four bodhisattvas, beginning with Samantabhadra, the bodhisattva of, de of devotion or determination. He rides a giant white elephant. Uh, Manjushri, bodhisattva of wisdom. Avilokiteshvara, the bodhisattva of compassion. And then in this upper corner here is Maitreya, the future coming Buddha. And what happened just there is, is that we just made one clockwise move around the center, and then we just made another clockwise move, which is how you read this mandala. And that ends with Maitreya, who will logically move into that next Buddha position. So again, right away, we're starting to have that clockwise motion. And of course, the 
our attention is being drawn to the center, which is this great cosmic Dharmakaya Buddha. There you have the eight uh, central figures around Vairochana in the middle and the eight petal lotus flower mandala, which was around forever. You eventually start to see just this mandala, the, the thing that I have in the middle in red. But this uh, Garbhadhatu mandala goes a little further than that. And it has these two big sides to it. And each of these sections has a primary uh, bodhisattva in the middle. And this left-hand side is the portion that is sort of dedicated to the bodhisattva of compassion, Avilokiteshvara. The other side of this mandala, or this unit over here, the central figure is a bodhisattva called Vajrapani, the Vajra holder. And right away, what you have going on here is a lotus, vajra, uh, feminine, masculine thing going on. The vajra, the very much being this kind of, um, insofar as Buddhists get into masculinity and femininity, which they really don't, but they do get into vajras and lotus flowers <laughs> as, as energies, like the floral and the metal implement right and so those are the balancing that those are the yin and yang qualities i would say of this mandala represented by these two sides there's also balance on the top and bottom here um in my longer talk of course i go into what all the uh, little figures are but i do just want to show that on the bottom here the very bottom central figure that is this feminine bodhisattva of wisdom pranya paramita so this is an actual uh, anthropomorphization of the paramita of wisdom. Next, we have this very large upper portion. And what's going on up here, this is where this mandala starts to get fun. This is where it starts to turn into like, um, like it, it's a small Buddha land after all, basically. So this whole upper portion that I have highlighted, that's Shakyamuni's area, you know, the Buddha. <laughs> so if you're familiar with like, you know, the Buddha, Siddhartha, Shakyamuni, the historical figure, that's where he fits into this mandala. He has this giant section in the front and all those smaller figures are Ananda, Shibuti, Shariputra, Kashapya, Magulyayana, and all of the Arhats. So the reason why I mentioned that for everybody that takes my Dharma Doors class and, and knows about like my, my allegorical approach to teaching Buddhism or teaching the sutras, this mandala, it, it contains the whole story. All the monks, all the bodhisattvas, all the Buddhas, all the Buddha lands. It's kind of like the whole story of Buddhism in one image, which is why as a storyteller, and as a Buddhist storyteller, I, I really like it. Balancing, this is interesting too, balancing uh, Shakyamuni's area at the top is this section down below. And this section is, is devoted to a particular bodhisattva called Akasha Garba. So there we are again with the Garba, this womb, very, you know, very uh, feminine, again, kind of imagery. And this is uh, Akasha Garba, space womb bodhisattva, who that's uh, space womb's entire area. I haven't talked a lot about space womb or Akasha Garba, but I've talked a lot about space in my Dharma talks. So this is the bodhisattva of space, <laughs> of the quality of space, of that quality of allowance, that's Akasha Garba. And you might have noticed these two figures, these very large uh, figures in the lower corners. These are actually the thousand armed, 11 headed Avilokiteshvaras. And so that's actually the third time Avilokiteshvara appears in this mandala. And so, yes, this mandala is very 
Avila Kiteshvara heavy, but it has to do with this thousand armed, 11 headed idea of Avila Kiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, who, if, if you read the sutras a certain way, every figure in this mandala is Avilokiteshvara in a different version or a different form. Or at least that is the, uh, you know, the Buddhology of Avilokiteshvara is that they are all kind of incarnations of Avilokiteshvara, Bodhisattva of compassion. These two figures, by the way, if you are looking at this um, two-dimensionally, I wanna start to move you into that three-dimensional uh, uh, view. And so I just want you to notice how the central Virochana figure and these two figures start to create that triangle that we are used to thinking about in mandalas, right? Oh, and by the way, the thousand armed, 11 headed Avilokiteshvaras, there's a light one and a dark one, a yang and a yin one. So you have a yin and yang thing going on like kind of all the time in this mandala. These two figures are actually, they're not in space wombs area. They are in their own area at the bottom. And it's important, and I'm, I'm walking you through this mandala in a very particular way. I am not going into it because I'm trying to do this very concisely, but I just want you to know that there's a very special way that you move through this mandala. And so we're going through it the right way. And so you start with this bottom here, but there is a um, this side, right? This northern side, this eastern side at the top, and then a barrier. And in the artwork of this mandala, there are four gates in these quadrants. And so those are entrances to the, the middle area here. And those are each treated as their own section. Whereas the outermost portion is considered one section. This is, when I first started studying this mandala, it was the outermost se section that sold me. And the reason why I love this mandala so much is that the, the characters that you find in the outermost portion of this are Shiva, Krishna, Brahma, all the Indian gods, the constellation gods, like all of um, Indian mythology is in the outer region. And so again, as a storyteller, as a Buddhist storyteller, all, it's like all you need is this mandala and you would have every character every story, every idea that you could eventually draw out of it. So it's a beautiful mandala for that. But we have one more dimension to go. Um, these are the sections again, the central dais as it's called, the two sections on those sides, the two sections on the top and bottom, the two sections above those, the four perimeters, and then this outermost section. So again, that's the kind of proper way to view this mandala is in those divisions. But the next place we need to go is deeper into that three dimension or that third dimension. And so in order to do that, we're going to twist our mandala a little bit to start to give you that kind of aerial view I talked about. I didn't want you to think that the uh, wheel of time or yeah, the Kala Chakra was the only one that was three dimensional. They're all 3D. But what's fun about this one from a Buddhist point of view is that the way that you should see this mandala is like this, with the outermost region being a little bit lower than this innermost region, lower than the, that, and then lower than the dais. And so it eventually would should, in your mind, start to look a little bit like this. So what we've done here is now we've separated this um, traditionally 12 divisions of the mandala. We've separated it into these plateaus. And these plateaus, if you are uh, familiar with the uh, Buddhist meditation, these plateaus represent the kamadatu or the realm of desire in the outermost ring. You go up a level, 
to the realm of form, the realm of dhyana meditation. You go up one more rung to the formless realm, right? That that uh, the realm of form of formlessness, the arupadhatu. And the highest peak is the realm of the Buddha, the enlightened realm of the Buddhas that is again beyond the triple realm, beyond the realm of desire, the realm of form and the formless realm. And so the idea is, is that making your way through this mandala is a mental journey from the realm of desire into the meditative realm of form and then into the realm of formlessness, eventually leading you to that middle central dais. And what's beautiful about this, what I have on the screen right now, and it's why I call this talk uh, Magic Circle, the Art and Architecture of Mandalas. Because this is way more than just aesthetics and art. We are now in the realm of architecture. And the reason why I say that is, is because mandalas in the Buddhist world eventually are three-dimensional. And this is the famous Borobudur mandala down in Java, Indonesia. This is a giant, I mean, I don't know if you can see, there's people, tiny little people on this. This is a giant three-dimensional mandala. It is a three-dimensional representation of the Garbhadhatu mandala that we were just looking at, but it is even more than that. It has even more uh, in it than just what is in the Garbhadhatu mandala. Again, I don't, I can't go too into detail, but I just want you to see how the experience of entering a mandala, and that is indeed what they will say, is that when you meditate a on a mandala, you enter it. And as I tried to show you with the Garbhadhatu mandala, there's particular orders and particular ways in which you make your way through a mandala. And that technology eventually jumps off the canvas and they start creating three-dimensional spaces where you can literally with your physical body, not just your mind, enter them and walk around, excuse me, enter them and walk around. So. This is just one of several uh, three-dimensional mandalas, but this is probably the most impressive. And that is our quick journey through the womb realm or the Garbhadhatu. I wanna share with you really quickly before I kind of start to wind this down to open it up for questions. This mandala keeps getting more and more interesting. This is a version of the mandala in which every Buddha and Bodhisattva and Hindu deity has been replaced or, or, or represented by a Sanskrit syllable. These are called bijas, seed syllables. They are essentially the seed, uh, seed sound of that Buddha, Bodhisattva or deity's mantra. And so each, and this is kind of appealing to the auditory quality of mandalas I spoke about at the beginning of the talk, where you could use this version of the mandala and each of the deities would then have a sound associated with them. And you could eventually, like I was talking about with the Vajra Yogini mandala, you could eventually take one of the seed syllables and make it its own mandala <laughs> dedicated to just that bodhisattva. And indeed, that's what happens in the Buddhist traditions that use this mandala. So that's just, again, just scratching the surface of the jewel that is the Garbhadhatu mandala. But before I finish with this talk and before I finish with that mandala, I also want to share with you this quick mandala. We're not going to walk through it. I just want to show it to you. This is the Vajra Dhatu, the Vajra realm. This is indeed probably as complex as Buddhist mandalas get. As you can see right away, it's actually nine mandalas as a mandala. But then if you really take a look at any one of those nine mandalas, they are actually a bunch of other mandalas. 
because it is circles within circles within circles within squares within circles within it goes on and on and on there's a a lot obviously symbolically going on with this mandala way beyond what i have planned for tonight two things really quickly the very very center of this mandala um sorry this part of it is often a mandala just unto itself called the Vajradhatu mandala. So this seems to be another case where there was an original mandala that got added on to and added on to and added on to. This mandala though, if you notice the odd, kind of the odd square in the upper middle, that is Vairochana Buddha again. But Vairochana is not at the middle, although he is at the middle of this, but he's at the upper top. And this Vairochana, this is a beautiful statue of this Vairochana, who is making the mudra of the one hand clasping the, the index finger of the other, which is the male phallus and the female yoni, the linga and the yoni, together in unison. So Vairochana, of course, is neither male nor female. I consider all Buddhas beyond uh, male and femaleness in that way. But Vairochana by that mudra deeply represents that kind of, well, he hexagonal union that we have been seeing. In many, many uh, a mandala, we have been seeing this kind of union of the elements, a harmony. And so mandalas, Buddhist mandalas in particular, are usually very harmonizing in that way. And I just wanted to show you this beautiful uh, image that, oops, sorry, that is at the top center of this mandala. And so this mandala of Vairochana and the Garbhadhatu mandala, also dedicated to Vairochana, these two mandalas are used together in a Japanese form of esoteric Buddhism. This is a Japanese tantric Buddhist school called the uh, Shingon, which is the mantra school. They use a lot of mantras, but this is a Shingon, a Japanese Shingon altar. And I want you to see there's the statue of Vairochana in the middle, but on either side of Vairochana is on one side, the, the Vajradhatu mandala and on the other side, the Garbhadhatu mandala. And so these two mandalas are used together in the Shingon tradition. The Shingon tradition uses a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of mandalas, but these two are the, the kind of the most sacred at the altar in that way. Uh, and actually what's kind of beautiful is I mentioned about the secret aspect of these uh, tantric traditions. It's often quite beautiful in a Shingon altar where you can't always see these mandalas. They're often very obscured. This is kind of the best image I could find where you could even kind of see them. But there is this sign of deep sacredness to these mandalas. Of course, they're kind of worshiped in this tradition, but they're also then brought out and used in ceremonies, used in meditation, used in initiations empowerments, all kinds of rituals and rites, which of course is a big part of the use of mandalas. And with that being said, I'm going to close the circle on this talk and turn it over to any questions or ideas or comments you might have, because that was a lot of information for an hour and 10 minutes. So. Thank you all so much for your uh, patient attention. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, Michael. shoot. Hi, Claudia. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Good. I really enjoyed your presentation, by the way. So oh. interesting. Oh. I, I, and I'm amazed. I'm blown away by how how can you remember all those names? Oh my God. <laughs> oh God. I'm giving I'm... this talk <laughs> over and over and over. Blown away. In any case, um, I was just curious to, uh, to find out if the um, mandala, the um, 
the three-dimensional, the architectural Garbadatu mandala that you showed, is it possible to actually climb on oh, that? Yeah. Oh, you can? Actually, yeah. And um, I was going to put a bunch of pictures, but I, I didn't. What's beautiful about that actually is it's a series of stairs that then go to these um, like walkways that go to other stairs that go to walkways. So you actually literally um, go the way that I was describing, but again, you do it physically and you go up steps, around, up steps, around, up steps, around. And the whole story of the Buddha is in uh, carved in relief. So you're, you're kind of studying the life story of the Buddha, but then it's stories from sutras, all kinds of stuff. And, and where do you say that it is? It's in, in Indonesia. Indonesia. Yeah. Where? where? It's called Borobudur. Borobudur. In okay. uh, Java. Okay. Thank and you. And I think the island it's on is called Borobudur, but I'm not sure about that. Okay. And right. then my other uh, couple of questions is uh, where do you teach and can one take a loose course from you? I mean, not to, I mean, I, don't, I oh. wouldn't intend to be, you know, to study. Oh, no, no, no. To get I, a degree in Buddhism, but I mean. Oh, I only teach it right now, the San Francisco Dharma Collective, Sunday nights, Dharma oh, Doors. Um, okay. And I have a private tutoring practice too. Um, and so you could email me if you're interested in that. And I am at some point going to offer some classes on my own to small groups of like five or six people. So stay tuned for that. But okay. as of right now, it's just private students and Sunday nights, SFDC. All right, great. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Michael, I had a question. Yeah. Um, is there any significance or um, is there any meaning to the colors or the color combinations that are used within the mandalas? Yes, absolutely. It's a whole layer that I really only touched on quickly. I mentioned the elements and their colors. Every mandala, all the colors are significant. Um, it's actually usually the juxtaposition of colors that is significant. The, the primary color, not the not primary colors, but the colors will primarily be significant of the elements in that way. But I do, it's, it's something that I just haven't had the time and, or energy or even resources for that matter to really pursue. But there is a deep um, color psychology thing going on with mandalas. Yeah, it's, and again, I don't know anything about it, but I know it's going on, <laughs> so. Yep, thanks, Ray. Yeah, Katie. So other than the practice of kind of building a mandala out of sand or drawing one, um, could you say a little bit more about using a mandala as a practice object? Yeah, definitely. So that's it, yeah. and. The only reason I didn't get into it in the talk is because I'm always worried I'm going to go too long. So I'm happy to answer it now because I got lots of time. Um, the basic way to think of it, mm, you know, esoteric uh, traditions, tantric Buddhist traditions, they have a, they, what are they, they make a claim. And the claim is about expediency. And what I mean is, is like, we'll make you enlightened faster than the other guy type of a, a thing. I, I say that jokingly, a, a, a better, less snarky way of saying it is that the esoteric tantric Buddhist tradition kind of uh, claims to have or whatever uh, technologies. And those technologies are usually reduced down to the, the mantras, the sacred recitations, the mudras, which the, the gestures, the seals or locks that you perform with your hands and your feet or, and legs, by the way, and these mandalas. And so the idea is, is 
that doing mantra recitation while performing certain mudras is more expedient or it's a form of enlightenment technology. And indeed the mandala is considered like in terms of doing sati, doing uh, mindful awareness practice, you, you might be, I know Katie, you are uh, familiar with like Kashina practice. So these uh, discs, elemental discs, or actual elements of fire, water, what have you. There's a way in which a mandala is this technology of that same order, which is a kind of like, yeah, staring at a candle flame will, will lock in your mind and bring about dhyana, but man, we got mandalas that'll just like blast you into dhyana, is kind of the idea that they're more expedient but I say that as a, a long-winded way of saying that mandalas are used as visual aids for anchoring attention and awareness to do sati or mindfulness. But in the same, yeah, in the, in the same breath as my answer to Ray about the colors, there is also a claim, it's also about the expediency of these things. And what they say is, is that the, well, there's a, they say this a lot of different ways. One of the ways they say this is that a mandala is an illustration of an enlightened mind and therefore putting your mind in that same geometric, uh, chromatic space, like it's a mimesis, mimesis going on. <laughs> or, so one says it's an illustration of the enlightened mind. The other says that, again, in my answer to Ray, the, the same thing, where there's a technology of juxtaposition a juxtaposition of colors, a juxtaposition of shapes, a juxtapositions of imagery. And what they say is, is just staring at these things changes your mind, like makes you more enlightened in a way. So those are two or three ways in which these are used, either as visualization aids or as actual machines to make you <laughs> enlightened in that way. And a third, I, I said it a few times because it's actually what I do a lot. They are mnemonics. They're giant mnemonic devices or giant memory palaces in that way, where just, you know, you, it's like a, a storyteller like I am, you know, and thank you, Claudia, for the compliment that I, I remember all this stuff, but it's, I, I have visual aids. They're called mandalas <laughs> and it's easier to, for a teacher like me, it's easier to remember these things when I have the visual aids. And so they're functioning on that level as well, a kind of storytelling device. That's a few, that's a few different ways. Yeah, cool. Any other comments, questions, ideas about these things? I know that, you know, they're, they're around, they're in pop culture. So I just want to, you know. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, there is a spot on the, on the Dharma Datu Mardala where there was not a figure, but there was like a triangle. It's kind of drew my attention. Or was it just? Uh, Which one? Uh, on the Dharma Datu Mandala that you spend that you spend probably the most time talking about. Oh, the Garba Datu Mandala. Oh, oh, you know it's funny. Yeah, the Garba Datu Mandala. What's funny is is that was a bunch of slides that got axed. It was a bunch of slides that got axed, and now of course I'm regretting axing them. Good eyes, Jarda. Is that the right pronunciation? It's actually Yarda. It's like Y instead. Oh of yeah, Yarda. Okay. Great, great observation, Yada, good eyes. So that particular one in the Garbadatu mandala is the only like um, non-anthropomorphic image. And it's a flaming triangle 
or pyramid, depending on if you go three-dimensional, on top of a lotus flower. It's in the, that top, above the middle, you, it's right there. It's kind of very much like a capstone, headstone thing. That particular image, a triangle on top of a lotus, is called the, the Sarva Tathagata, no, the, the Sarva Tathagata Sarvanyana Mahamudra, all Tathagatas, all knowledge, great seal. It's like the great seal of wisdom of Buddhism. The upwards pointing triangle, and these are the slides that I had, the upwards pointing triangle is this sort of symbol of, especially the flaming upwards pointing triangle is the symbol of like, um, well, enlightenment or wisdom. And the lotus flower is the, the representation of compassion. And so what you have is the symbol for wisdom and compassion in one. So that's a mandala unto, all unto itself. The lotus flower with the triangle, which is compassion and wisdom, which is kind of a Buddhist yin and yang. I, I mentioned at some point, you know, that you know, Buddhists are not really into the whole feminine masculine thing. Think, think, thank Buddha. Thank Buddha. They don't care that, but they don't get too into that polarity. What they kind of offer you instead is wisdom and compassion. It's like heart and mind, intellect, logic, reason, whatever. And then meta, compassion, love, like, so those are the two polarities in Buddhism and the unity, the, the unity of those two, not, yeah, male, female, yes, let's, let's come together. But the unity of compassion and wisdom, that's the real harmony in that Buddhist tradition. So thanks, Yarda. Um, Michael, a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, um, you were first. I saw your hand first. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead, Connie. I'll, I'll go for the first time. He's, the, he's moderating. <laughs> <laughs> it actually just have a quick um, short question. Um, do mandals um, uh, dif differ in regards of um, Buddhist traditions? You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, Theravada or like mm -hmm. do they differ or or don't you see any differences between the, the schools or lineages or it's that's a very complicated question Connie and the, um, you know in general the Theravada tradition does not use mandalas but it's not beyond it's not that you will not find mandalas in Southeast Asia and in the, that tradition. So they're there, but they tend to shy away from uh, some of that stuff. Again, not all, not all the time. Otherwise, mm, otherwise, the reason why your question is tricky to answer is, is that, you know, even mandalas in general are not originally Buddhist. And the use of them is like not this Buddhist thing. The uh, chanting mantras is not originally a Buddhist thing. And doing the mudra gestures is not originally a Buddhist thing. They are a tantric thing. And, you know, tantrism is a kind of a beast unto itself. It's sort of a, a way of being religious, some call it magical, esoteric for sure, all of these things. And so that way of being religious, the tantric way, the secret, esoteric, need a teacher, get initiated, learn the secret handshake, that type of religious behavior comes to Buddhism. And what I mean to say is the Tibetan Buddhist traditions are almost entirely uh, uh, initiation-based, secret-based, guru-based, all of that, using mudras, mantras, and mandalas. But this way of being Buddhist, or sorry, 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 this way of being religious, the esoteric tantric way, 
it kind of permeated all of Buddhism. And so what you get is in the Pure Land Buddhist tradition, the devotional school of Buddhism, you get mandalas of the Pure Lands, but, and, and I've shown one, one is of um, Baishadja, Baishadja Guru, the, the medicine Buddha's uh, Buddha land mandala, but it's all these herbs, all the medicinal herbs. It's like an encyclopedia of medicinal herbs, but in a mandala. So, Every, you know, everybody here is like, well, that makes perfect sense, Michael, because you taught us all about mandalas as being these storehouses and repositories for information. So that's, but it looks a little different because it is these little herbs. And then awesome, great question, because it allows me to kind of go full circle to my Zen, uh, original Zen mandala, because when the mandala esoteric tantric tradition comes to the zen tradition they're like we don't need all that the fancy stuff on the sides we don't even need the triangles just the the mandala the essence of the circle and so connie again great question because indeed the mandala in the in the zen tradition looks very different than in japanese shingon different than pure land all of that so I could go on and on. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. No. Um, yeah, I am wondering with the 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 many triangles uh, mandala, mm -hmm. the yantra one. If I counted correctly, there were five facing down and four facing up, and there seemed to be that one extra in the middle. <laughs> Did I count incorrectly? It's funny because I was staring at the mandala this morning and it took me a very, very long time. And I don't, I'm probably, I don't know if I'm right, actually. Everybody's got to go look at the Sri Yantra. But the very, very center triangle that's pointing down yeah. is made from other triangles. You don't think it's its own triangle? Well, then, then you would have to include a lot of other triangles then. Okay. You know what I mean? Because there's yeah, a lot. Yeah, I'll look at it again. I'm I'm super intrigued by it because I was wondering why it's weighted toward that, why there would be one more of those than the other, but I'll look at it again. But I'm also super interested in, because you mentioned there was a Pentagon, Pentagon one, one that you didn't share. And I'm wondering what other, uh, what other uh, hexagon or, uh, pent or, uh, or polygons there are. Like, oh, are any yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And in another version of the talk, there's a five. It's five, but what's interesting is it's five squares. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's that's wild. Um, yeah, and then definitely with the, the Sri Yantra, the beautiful one, it takes uh, further looking. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everybody, I think that's time.